Hello, so now uh, we're going to be moving on to chapter 8 of Maurizio's uh, classic mythology uh, in context. Uh, and this deals with uh, two gods, Apollo and Artemis. And unlike most of the chapters that deal with more than one god, which focus on a single god and the other one gets just sort of like a brief mention, um, Apollo and Artemis get almost equal treatment here. Um, the problem is, is that we have a Homeric hymn to Apollo, which is actually pretty extensive, and we have a few Homeric hymns to Artemis, but they're all fairly short. So uh, it's, but Artemis does get actually, you know, a fair amount of uh, consideration. So both Apollo and Artemis are gods who oversee the transition from childhood to adulthood. So in the case of Apollo, this is boys becoming men, um, <clears throat> which means you know becoming part of the citizen body. Uh, certainly in the case of Athens, um, becoming true Spartans in the case of <clears throat> Spartan youth. Um, prior to that, they are not <clears throat> sort of viewed as true Spartans until they under, undergo, <clears throat> you know, a uh, a sort of trial by fire, and then they're viewed as, as real Spartans. And interestingly enough, uh, <clears throat> Spartan youth are one of the few that have uh, Artemis overseeing that as well. <clears throat> so there's a ritual uh, in, in honor of Artemis in, in Sparta that oversees that transition for young Spartan males. Um, Athens does not have an equivalent. Um, Artemis generally is overseeing girls up to the point of their transition. So for girls, the transition is they're girls, they're virgins, um, they're considered sort of wild things, but when they are about to get married, then they have to leave the world of Artemis and really then be ruled by Hera, the goddess of marriage, and Aphrodite, the goddess of sexual desire. Um, so as long as they're virgins and wild things, seem sort of like wild animals, they're under Artemis's protection. But um, they have to say good. In effect, they have to say goodbye to Artemis. And a lot the the rituals that deal with Artemis and young women uh, often involve this saying goodbye. They're right. They're moving on to to a new stage in their life where Artemis will no longer play a role. Uh, until, I guess, they're moms of daughters themselves, and then, of course, they will have some role in how Artemis plays in their, their daughter's life. So the, um, the literature for chapter, <clears throat> there are two pieces uh, in, from chapter um, 8. One is Homeric hymn number 3b to Apollo, and the other is Homeric hymn number 27 to Artemis. Now you'll notice two things. One is I've got Homeric hymn number 3b to Apollo in italics. Uh, that is because it's a longer work. Um, Homeric hymn number 27 to Artemis is a short work. It's, a, I don't know, like 30 lines long. <clears throat> and so that's in quotation. So it's more like a lyric poem as far as its length goes. Um, the Homeric hymn to Artemis basically just talks about Artemis's sort of areas so we see your hunting, then we see your dancing, right? These are two areas associated with Artemis. Homeric hymn number 3b tells the story of the creation of Apollo's oracle at Delphi. Um, so uh, one of the things about Apollo is he's a god of prophecy. His prophetic center was at Delphi, which is in north central Greece. Um, people would go there, they would... Um, <clears throat> First, they'd have to be approved, right? So they, they would make sort of, in effect, an application to be heard by the by the Pythia, the, the priestess. Um, and they would either be accepted or not. If they were accepted, they would have, have to sacrifice some animals. Uh, and then um, they would pose a question. The Pythia would then go into some sort of trance. She would then start spouting stuff in some sort of weird, strange language, not Greek. Uh, and then a priest would interpret that and put it into um, a, uh, an elegiac couplet. Uh, so a two-line poem, um, you know, and <clears throat> that would be the answer. And of course, these answers were notoriously ambiguous, which would, of course, allow the oracle for pretty much always being right. Um, so a famous case is um, the uh, King Croesus, 
um, who was the richest man uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean at the time uh, that he lived. Um, and uh, he was being attacked by the Persians. Now, the Persians at the time were not a great empire. They were small. They were just within the area of modern-day Iran. Uh, but they were expanding, and they were expanding into his territory. <clears throat> and so he had to decide whether he was going to go to war or whether he was going to sort of like accept the situation with, with the Persians controlling some of his territory. He went, he sent people to Delphi, they asked, and what the oracle told them was, if you attack, um, you know, the Persians, a great empire will fall. Well, he thought it was the burgeoning uh, Persian empire, which was starting to grow, that would fall and that he'd be victorious. Obviously, he lost the battle. Now, there's a good example of no matter how it turned out, the oracle could say, you see, we told you. So, um and sometimes they're just like weirdly ambiguous and you don't know what they mean. Um, but why is it called Homeric Hymn 3B? Well, <clears throat> Homeric Hymn number three actually has two parts. The first part, which is about a third of the whole poem, tells the story of Apollo's birth. And this is sometimes called Homeric Hymn 3A to Delian Apollo. And then 3B tells the story of Apollos creating his shrine at Delphi called uh, 3B to Pythian Apollo. Now, most scholars, I think, believe that these are two separate poems. And the, the chief bit of evidence is at the end of 3A, there is this sign-off, right, where the, <clears throat> where the poet, the singer, is basically saying you Delian maidens, you, you girl, young women of Delos, if someone comes and asks you who the best poet is, tell him that it's this blind man from Chios. That sounds like the poet, whoever it is. And of course, this is where the idea of Homer being a blind poet comes from. Um, that, uh, you know, you will say, it's me, the guy who's singing his song now. Um, that makes no sense if that comes basically a third into a longer poem. Why is, are they, is it just written as one poem in the man, manuscripts? Probably because you had a poem to Apollo and you have another poem to Apollo and there's nothing in between. So all the other cases, there's more than one poem to Zeus. There's more than one poem to uh, Artemis. There's more than one poem to Athena. They're, those are all fairly short, but they're also divided by a lot of other poems. So here, I think the fact that you've got two poems to Apollo right next to one another, they got merged into one poem. Uh, the style of the poems is also different. Um, there's a light tone to the first poem. Uh, the, the Homer Kim 3B is not particularly light. Um, all right, the scholarship for chapter eight uh, focuses on, uh, you know, rituals. So this is dealing with ritual. And here rituals are, um, uh, the rituals looked at are ones that involve rites of passage. Um, so a rite of passage would be something like marriage, right? Before that, you're single. After that, you're married. However you can configure marriage. Um, and even if it's not a formal marriage ceremony, you could do some ceremony on your own that would still constitute marriage, right? So you're doing a ritual before you're one thing, after you're something else. Uh, confirmation in the Roman Catholic Church would be a, an instance. Bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah would be another in the, in, uh, for the Jews. Uh, this is a point where you're, before this you're one thing and then after that you're something else. Uh, going into the army, boot camp, would be another rite of passage. You go in, you're not a soldier, you come out, you are a soldier. Right, so there's a, there is a change. <clears throat> now, there are other types of rituals that you can have, right? You can have annual rituals that uh, d deal with like the harvest or things that happen every year. Those are not rites of passage, right? They represent something that's going on, that's cyclical, that happens every year, right? It's just the same thing year after year after year. Um, there is a, it's still a, a, an important t time, but it's not like before this you were one thing and after this you're something else, right? That's so the, the rites of passage. So Arnold van Gennep 
uh, came up with a schema, a right of uh, like a uh, outline, uh, where he looked at rites of passage and he claimed that there were three uh, stages to rites of passage uh, stories. The first part is separation, and that can simply be they take place in a special place and you go there for it. So like the Eleusinian Mysteries, you leave, you're in Athens and then you go to Eleusis, right? So there's this clear separation from the, where you had been to some other place. It can be something more than that, but sometimes it's as simple as just physical separation. The second part is the the what the the crisis, the trial, the thing that you have to go through. So if it's a circumcision ritual, it would be circumcision. Um, if it's marriage, it's the wedding ceremony itself, right? The thing you have to go through, and then there is the post ritual thing, and that is. Uh, you're you're learning to um, you 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 venture a new phase. So in the case of like marriage, after the wedding ceremony, you are now part of a couple. You're no longer an individual looking out just for yourself. In theory, I, the ceremony may or may not have an effect depending on how much you believe in the ceremony. But that's a good way of looking at things, and that way of looking, you can look at myths this way as well. Uh, Joseph Campbell, who wrote a lot about myths, looked at this as, he called this the monomyth. The hero gets the call of adventure, that's the separation part. So Luke Skywalker just, you know, gets the, the word from the princess, and then he goes on the adventure. He has the adventure, and after the adventure, he's a hero. He's no longer a farm boy, right? He's changed. Um, so... Um, but consider that in, in when you when you read this thing, and of course Apollo and Artemis both are goddesses, uh, gods of uh, uh, this ritual change. The uh, the comparison section is interesting because it is a Greek work. Uh, it's a work by a man named Xenophon called an Ephesian Tale. We have the opening, um, I don't know, four pages or five pages of that work. Um, that work is a romance. Uh, Greek romance is not romance in our sense of the word, um, it, although they are related. Uh, they're called romances because they take place against the backdrop of the Roman Empire, and usually they involve travel of the, of the characters all around the Roman Empire, all around the Mediterranean. Hence the, time, the term romance. This is the birth of the novel, right? So this is where the novel starts. It starts with these Greek romances. Um, so, in an Ephesian tale, uh, we have the story of two young people, a young man and a young woman. They see one another at a ritual in honor of Artemis. Artemis had her main uh, cult center at Ephesus, which is a town in modern-day Turkey, um, but it was a Greek city on the coast, um, and uh, it was with the main, as I said, the main center for the worship of Artemis. Um, there's a festival there every year. At this festival, they see one another, they fall in love, then something happens to split them up, and they spend the rest of the work trying to get back together again, and by the end, they succeed in that, and they live happily ever after. Right? So that's the romance novel sort of template, and it's the modern romance template as well, right? Right? They meet, they sort of fall in love, something happens that keeps them apart, and then they're they come together right so that's the and by the way in a modern romance the one absolute rule in modern romance is it has to have a happily ever after ending it has to have a happily ever after ending if you've got a romance story that ends with the, the, the couple deciding they're not really meant for one another that's not a romance novel it may have romance elements it's not a romance novel um and then the, uh, the modern stuff, the Nock Laban section, deals with three poems um, on Actaeon and Daphne. So Actaeon is a young man, he's a hunter. Um, he's out hunting one day, he hears a noise, he goes to investigate, and it's uh, Artemis, uh, and she is bathing, so she's naked. Artemis is a virgin goddess, she protects her virginity quite vigorously. Um, when she sees Actaeon, seeing her naked, she then turns him into a stag. His own hunting dogs attack him, and then his friends come to investigate, and then they 
Uh, in some versions, they finish the job. In some, some versions, the dogs finish the job. But the point is, he ends up dead. Um, and the modern takes on this often look at things like um, that moment when a child ends up becoming aware of sexual difference. Right, that, that, it's that, that moment. So, um, like a young boy happens to stumble in to see his mother or some older woman changing. And if he's heterosexual, that has some sort of effect in his psyche. And then, you know, later he grows up to be desir desirous of women. Obviously, that does not apply then if, you know, the person is, you know, uh, homosexual, not heterosexual. But the template, at any rate, is, is viewed as, is taken here as the norm. Um, the story of Daphne is Apollo. Apollo uh, is joking around with uh, uh, Cupid, and Cupid pulls out his bow, and he's playing with his bow, and, and Apollo says, hey, kid, that's not a bow. This is a bow, and he takes his bow, which is much bigger, and says, you know, why don't you put that toy away? You might hurt yourself. And Apollo, I mean, um, uh, Cupid then shoots him with a, an arrow, which uh, makes him fall in love with Daphne, but he shoot, shoots a reverse arrow at Daphne, so that Daphne wants to avoid Apollo. So Apollo goes chasing after Daphne. Daphne's running away. Daphne wants to escape this basically sexual aggression, um, and she prays to her father, who's a river god uh, named Peneus, um, to do something, and he magically transforms her into a tree, specifically a laurel tree, the word Daphne in Greek means laurel. So D laurel becomes a laurel tree or Daphne becomes a Daphne tree. Um, and that tree or the laurel, which is plentiful around Delphi, uh, is also the, the, the tree that's associated with Apollo. So if you compete in athletic events at Delphi, you would get a laurel wreath as your, your, as your prize if you won. All right, so that finishes chapter eight. Uh, that ran on a little bit. Um, and uh, next time, we're going to look at chapter nine. Chapter nine looks at Dionysus, and that will finish our look at the Olympian gods. Then we'll be moving on to heroes.